Amen. Awesome. Praise the Lord. A couple things right off the bat. One, good morning. Glad you're here, alive and well and awake, and praise God, it's almost dry out there. That's a miracle itself, amen. But it's good to see you today. Uh, two things. One, we just did our men's retreat, annual men's retreat, which was just phenomenal. Men, can I hear that? Amen. I mean, it was a, a glorious time. Yeah, go ahead and praise the Lord. It's worth it. Uh, probably should have sent some video to the, get it ready for it. It's nothing, there's nothing more awesome than being in a room full of men just singing the top of their lungs and worshiping God. And I took a video of about 70 men just worshiping the Lord. And it was just a great turnout, great attendance, great fellowship. The power of God showed up. We had people saved, people set free, people still living for Jesus today. Amen. So what a great time in the Lord it was. And uh, it's just an exciting time to be a part of what God's doing. And uh, if you're not a part of that, you're just missing out. So don't miss out. Too many good things coming down the pike. You don't want to miss a one of them. Second thing I want to say, uh, besides the men's retreat, is uh, this is Gary Warhead's first official Sunday as our campus pastor. <laughs> Give him a blessing and praise the Lord. We will have an ordination. We'll talk about the dates on Monday. But I thought Palm Sunday might be a good one, you know. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We'll hold out our palms. And just remember there's a crucifixion after that. But... <laughs> <laughs> But amen. God is so good. So many great things are happening. I hope that you're a part of what the Lord is up to and you're just enjoying the the service of the Lord. It's been a crazy weekend. I've already preached about five times. You guys that came to the retreat probably tired of hearing me already. Uh, A couple more to go. All right. So I'll be preaching this morning. I preached tonight over in Conroe at a church. Asked me to come over and minister to them. But uh, so appreciate your prayers. I told Kath this morning preaching. I said, I kept having trouble coming up with words. You know, I kept thinking, what is that word? And then when I thought of it, I couldn't say it. Innuendo. (laughs) <laughs> it just didn't, didn't fall off the mouth just right. But uh, we're here and we're praising the Lord. Amen. We're finalizing this sermon series on battle ready. And we've talked a lot about the, the warfare. We've talked about the, the weapons of our warfare and the armor of God in great, great detail. This is the fifth week in the series that we're, we're looking at. Today, I want to wrap this up by talking more specifically with how this, this armor is used in our spiritual life. There's a lot of people say, well, okay, I know what the armor is now. I understand it in Ephesians 6 and what this, those six parts are and what that is. And, but I want to talk in this, I guess, in, in kind of an application of all this more than anything else. How does this, how does this become effective? What does it really mean to, to be standing firm in the armor of God? And, you know, really, then, how do we carry out the war, you know, that goes on in our life every day? So let's look at this whole passage again from verse 10 to verse 17 in, in Ephesians chapter 6, where it says, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, that's an accurate description of all the, and the, the realm of, of the demonic, all right, and how demons work in the activity. We dealt with that a little bit. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, since now that's all out there, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with the truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts or missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 18, I didn't know if I had to click or not. Arthur. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints. As we look at this, this whole passage of Scripture together, there's just a whole lot here. And we dealt mostly and foremostly with these elements of these six different aspects of the armor in, in the Word of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate that we put on, which is the righteousness of God. Our shoes need to be the right kind of shoes so we can stand in battle. We talked about the the Roman sandals. They were the most uh, well-designed footwear of the day. They were designer footwear made specifically for Roman soldiers so that like the Roman armies who had long marches and long distances could withstand long marches so the feet would be ready to stand in battle. Alexander uh, the Great put a lot of emphasis on footwear in battle. 
We talked about that. We talked about the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of spirit. And we got very specific with all that. Those of you who are, who are watching perhaps by our Facebook Live today, you can go back and look at those. Or you can also, if you're here today and didn't see those, you might be interested in looking at that. We do have a, a, a YouTube channel as well called BF Church Video. You just It's all one word, BF Church Video. Look that up and you can Google up or bring up these other sermons, go YouTube the channel up and you'll find them available there. But it's important that we get this information down in our lives as Christians because we are in a war. And so many people fail to realize that and due to their failure or ignorance of it, they end up in battle and in their life and they end up losing the battle in their life. We have clearly seen what we have been given. And in a nutshell, what we've been given for battle is everything that we need to win the battle. You say, Brother Joe, I'm not winning, and I've got all this, uh, I understand what these this elements are and what these different virtues represent in my life about, you know, the righteousness and the truth and, and all these, these parts of that, but, you know, what, what how, how does this work? You know, how, do you, how do you put this into action when you're in the battle? And so you have the protection and you're able to move on in a defensive way and as well as this offensive way to, to be victorious. Well, I want us to start right there at verse 10 in the first words that he says and remind you first and foremost that this is a spiritual battle. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. If we're going to win, it's going to be accomplished by putting on the full armor of God all that, as we said before in Romans 13, 14, just represents the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 13, 14, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. It'll, simply put, it means I'm going to follow Jesus today. I'm going to trust Jesus today. I'm going to rely on Jesus today. It's not that God puts us in a battle position and armors us and then still even giving us all that has us depend upon our own energies our own strength, our own wisdom. We have the power of God disposable to us, and we need to realize that and take a faith step to say, I have everything I need today to be what God's called me to be today and to be victorious in Christ Jesus because I have Christ Jesus. And this armor, all of it represents Christ Jesus. So he tells us, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then he gives us this insight to how that's really going to be accomplished by, he says, by putting on the full armor of God. So you can stand firm. And he said, here, here's where he wrote it up. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And he said, because, then he tells us about our struggle. You need to be strong in the Lord. In other words, you can't do it yourself. You need God. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit filling your life because you are in a struggle. So many people in their life, they're struggling all the time, but they're fighting the wrong enemies. They're dealing with the wrong, they think it's the government, they think it's their wife, they think it's their husband, they think it's their boss, they think it's their kids. And the struggles are on all these different fronts and they got all this conflict going on in their life and they don't realize that behind those things that can be seen are things that cannot be seen and there's a spiritual force and power and spiritual entities in power that we are called to struggle against. And literally this word struggle, you know, it has, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat like we talked about last week. In other words, as a Christian, I'm just not standing around saying, oh, I love Jesus, everything's great. I'm involved in some things here, but as, as I am involved, I am trusting the Lord for his strength and for his might. I have to realize that this is a struggle. And the second thing, it's spiritual. All right? It, it's not with flesh and blood. And I know that might scare some of you, but remember what we said a couple weeks ago? You know, we don't have to be scared of demons because we have been made stronger than demons through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Go back and read chapter 1 of Ephesians that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus far above, and use these same words as Jesus in chapter 6, above principalities and powers and dominions. In other words, Jesus is greater than all those things. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So you have who you need, and if you have who you need, you have what you need. So you need to realize you do have some responsibilities, though. You have to enter into the conflict, and it's a spiritual conflict, and you have to realize that as you enter into this conflict, it's not just jump in there. Satan's very strategic, and he tells us as we go through this how we respond to Satan's wiles, his strategies, his methods, the fiery darts. He gives us clarity on how we deal with those things. Everything from what goes on in our mind, having the helmet of salvation on and realizing that the majority, 99.9% .9 of the spiritual battle is right up in here in our head where Satan comes and, and plants his lies and he, he, his, his doubts and his discouragement and all those things come in our head and heart. If you don't learn how to deal with it here, you're not going to have victory out here. 
So he says, you're in a struggle, and it's a strategic battle. There's schemes, there's method, there's fiery darts, there's lies. So here's what you do. And then what do you do? Because all this is going on, you have the strength of the Lord, you have this struggle going on. The first thing he tells us ultimately is, after being strong in the Lord, is you put on the armor of God. You put on the armor of God. Now, I didn't take every, I have about seven things I want to talk to you about this morning, and this is already, you know, number three, so we're moving along real well, you're listening good. But understand, I haven't taken time to alliterate this. These are just simply what the Bible tells us to do without any, any fancy topical dressing to it, okay? It's just that there's a war, there's a struggle, and you've been called to put on the arm of God. In fact, it almost looks like he tells you this twice, but there is a little differentiation uh, and variation in the word that he uses in the original language. In the, in, in the English, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Later, he says, put on the full armor of God. But there are two different words here. The first word about putting on the, uh, the armor of God is basically get dressed for war. Take the moment in the day as you start the day to prepare yourself. And that's why I think it's important before we get out of bed even, we say, Lord, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'll rejoice and be glad. As my feet hit the ground, I'm starting to talk with God. I think it's important we have time where I can open up the Word, spend a little time with the Lord, get everything in order, get my armor on before I dress the day. All right? You say, well, I'm not used to doing that. Well, here's a great habit that will literally transform your life. Take some time with God. Hear from the Lord. Get your Bible open. Let God speak to you and you speak to God. But basically what we're saying... Get dressed. Don't fight naked, all right? Get dressed. You need the armor of God on yourself or you will be defeated. And isn't it interesting that twice, he says, the whole armor or the full armor? So there's no place for gaps. There's no place for leaks. Don't, don't leave your hat. Don't leave your helmet. Don't leave your shield. Don't leave your shoes. Put everything on, you know? Put on everything. Now, obviously, you may have to put some stuff off before you put on. You've got to put off the old man, put off the old flesh, put off the self, and let Jesus take charge of your life. Don't, th- don't think this is a complicated process. It's not. But what this really speaks to, and he says it this way twice about the whole and the full armor, is that there's really no place, you know, for, for compromise in your life. There's no place to, to just, you know, not get it covered. No partial commitment. The person in the Christian life who's only partially committed, who has compromise in their life, is going to be the person in the Christian life who is the most defeated person in the Christian life. Do I need to say that again? That was awful dead, wasn't it? That may be a little... If it's convicting, say, praise the Lord, God talking to me, keep coming, all right? Don't shut it down, keep it coming. Let me know how to deal with this. But the person who allows compromises in their life is going to be the person who's defeated. You can't leave the sword. You can't drop your shield. And Satan will do everything through his little minions and his little imps to get you discouraged and defeated. So you drop your little shield and say, watch the use. I can't do this anymore. That's just, you pick the shield up. No air. Even the the breastplate of righteousness covered part of the back, all right? So you have this protection. Don't leave a place for gaps and leaks and compromises to settle in your life. You take up, you put on, get dressed in the armor of God. And what he says in verse 13, after I put on, he says, take up, literally. It's what the word literally means when he says, put on the whole armor of God. And it may say in your translation, it may use the word, take up the full armor of God. That's not repetitive. You put it on. This is a word which means to bring something along or to take something on board. In other words... Put it on, don't leave anything behind. You're going out into the world. You're going out into a difficult area of battle. You're going out to an arena where Satan is in charge of things. And you need to be completely prepared and ready, so don't leave anything behind. It's like the old American Express commercial. Y'all remember that? Don't leave home without it. Some of you need to leave home without your American Express probably. (laughs) Please leave home without it. You put enough on there already. But, you know, this is something you can't leave at home. Don't leave home without it. It's a, it's a conscious effort in the part of your life as a child of God to say, I'm getting in touch with Jesus today. And I'm going to walk in touch with God today. And I'm going to stay close to God today. And I'm going to walk in fellowship with God today. Some people don't, don't get all wrapped up in actions and steps and religious activities. It's all about this fellowship and it's all about this relationship. And this armor is in my life to protect that fellowship and my walk with Jesus Christ and to keep me from being defeated. 
Now, this next part of this verse is the reason why we put on, why we stay strong in the Lord and why we put on and why we take it up and take it with us as we go. And he says in verse 13, as he goes, he said, so take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist. So I may have gotten behind myself here, all right? Three and four. Anyway, I'm going the wrong direction. It's upside down. <laughs> if you've been doing as much of this this week as I have, upside down is understandable. Y'all maybe just need to have it repeated one more time. Is that it? <laughs> maybe it was a sovereign act of God. So you may be able to do what? Yes. Resist. Now the devil will tell you, they're kind of like the, the Borg or whatever it was, collective, you know, resistance is futile. But it's not. You resist. You stand on your ground. And it, it literally means now, you've been praising the Lord for all he's got. All he's done, all he's given you, that's a hallelujah, amen. But now you've you got to do something here. This is where you enter the battle. This is where you, you make an action, and it's an action of resistance that I will not take this. I'm not going to accept this. In fact, it's a word which has to do with a hostile action is taking place, all right? This is not paintball, all right? This is the real deal. This is, this is action. This is where you make a decisive commitment to the Lord that I have taken on the whole armor of God and I'm going to resist the devil, all right? James 4 put it that way. Resist Satan, you know, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, some of you think that just sounds way too simple. Well, that's kind of the beautiful thing about the whole deal is that it's a lot more simple than we have a tendency to make it. In the way you want to complicate everything. I just don't know if I can do that. I'm not that old. Where do you think all that thoughts come from? That's part of the battle you're in. I'm going to submit to God. What am I doing? I'm taking on the whole armor of God. I'm putting on Jesus Christ. I'm not in charge today. Jesus is in charge. Simple step. And now I can move forward. And as the enemy comes against me, hey, I can resist those forces that are coming against me. And I can withstand those forces. But it means there is an action taking place. It's not a friendly action towards the enemy. It's an opposition. I am against what Satan has got going. I am not for it. I'm not going to go for it. I'm not going to be a part of it. Please understand. Make it clear in your mind that the devil's not your friend. All right. All those little imps and all those little minions of hell. And there's many of them. I think I mentioned at the staff retreat. I mean, the, the men's retreat this week. And we talked a little bit about spiritual warfare and, and fighting in the spiritual warfare. And we talked about the multitude of demonic spirits that are in the world. Remember when Satan fell from heaven, he was cast out that he took with him one third of the angelic host. That's a lot of demons. You say, well, how many angelic hosts are there? To be exact, a bunch. <laughs> a whole lot. If you went to the book of Revelation, remember all those scenes of heaven that John is recording. And he says, and I saw around about the throne of God, 10,000s of 10,000s of 10,000 angels worshiping God. Now, 10,000 to the 10,000 power to the 10,000, that's a lot. Okay, I'll put it that way. Billions and trillions of angels. One third fell already. So there's plenty of demons out there for everybody, okay? <laughs> and if not, he doesn't take but one to kind of get the old flesh and the world working against you already anyway. We sometimes have this infernal foe called our flesh that we have to deal with. But there's this action on our part. It's a hostile action. Remember, you say, what's the devil's deal? The devil's deal is he hates you. And if you have anything in your mind that says the devil is not going to bother me if I go ahead and compromise, I'm just tired of fighting this war. I just don't want to. It's hard living the Christian life. And you just decide to lay it all down and put your armor down. And you think everything's going to be fine. You're in for a sad, sad story. Because it doesn't work that way. There is no room for compromise. None whatsoever with your enemy. And if you come up and you think you've made a pretty good deal with the devil, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. He'll say, okay, that works for me. And then he'll lie. Because he's the father of lies. He never, he never comes through. He never pays in real currency. He's a counterfeiter. He's a liar. And he's a destroyer. And he comes with one intent for your life. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. Your enemy has come to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. Now, those are words from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And demons knew very well who he was. Every time they encountered Jesus, it says, oh, get away from me, thou son of the most high God. And would flee. You can be sure that Satan hates you. You say, why does he hate me? I didn't do anything. He hates you, one, even when you didn't know God because you are made in the image of God and every time he looks at you, he's reminded of God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it may be hard for you to get in your mind, but just get that down. There's something about you that reminds the devil about God. Amen. And he's ticked off and he doesn't like it and he, he opposes that. But then you add to that fact, those of you who've given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he really hates you because not only are you an image, you possess him now in your life. Christ is in your life. Now, I didn't deal with the devil a whole lot. I didn't think when I didn't know Christ. I just chose to be a prisoner of his bondage like we all do before we know Christ. The Bible says we're by nature the children of wrath. We're by nature in bondage to our sin. That we're born in sin and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. So Satan has this under his authority. Ephesians chapter 2 deals with that. It says we're just children of disobedience, children of darkness. All right. Jesus told the Pharisees, even in their religiosity, you're just children of your father the devil. That wouldn't go real big today, would it? Tell a bunch of religious folks, they're just, your father's the devil. I don't I, I would get in the secret sense of the move very well. So he hates you because you remind him, one, of the creation, the creative glory of God, and you bear the image of God. Second of all, you have the Son of God through his Spirit living in your life. So before you come to Christ, you're in bondage. He didn't deal with you too much, but unfortunately, most people in bondage keep inviting him in. Through more rebellion, through more disobedience, just opens the door for more trouble in their heart and life. But when you come to Christ, you can be sure that God is going to, to work in you greatly so that you're prepared for the attack. But you can be sure that Satan is going to come against you even greater. Because one, he couldn't keep you from knowing God, but he wants to keep you from being what God has called you to be. And when you are what God called you to be, he doesn't like it. It affects him. It affects his kingdom. It ruins his work. It's against everything he's up to in the world, in the culture, in the society around us. You, living for Jesus, are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. I, I, you may not believe that. But I believe when we walk with Jesus and we're in, in his authority and submitting to him as, and his lordship in our life. And we're dressed in, in his righteousness and in living and walking in the spirit of God. That when we move throughout the world on a daily basis, this light and this salty effect of our life is touching people all around us. It is making a difference all, even though we cannot see it, it's still going on. We don't see the spiritual realm. But if you could see what's happening with your life when you're living for Jesus in the spiritual realm, it just might shock you to see the powerful effect that you have in the world today. And so Satan, he sees it. He's opposed to it. He doesn't like it when you live for Jesus. You've heard me say before, we ought to so be on fire for Christ that every morning when we wake up, the devil says, oh, no, he's up again. Amen? That'll be our desire and our passion. That should be our testimony. I want to have that kind of effect for the kingdom of God. And we all possess that. Now, I know you're saying, well, little old me, I ain't nothing good going on. You are so blind as to what God has done in you and for you and will do with you when you get serious about your walk with God and get committed to Christ on the level he's desiring you get committed. And when you get that place, you resist the devil and he does what? He does what? Hey, that's a powerful word, is it not? Yes. That Satan would flee my presence? Absolutely. Because a greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So you resist him. And then he says, you stand firm in verse 13. In fact, he repeats it in verse 14. And having done all to stand firm, stand firm. All right. Having done everything to prepare yourself for battle, do battle. Having trained Having prepared, having suited up, you are battle ready. Now do battle. Resist the enemy. Stand strong in the Lord. And it literally is an idea that we stand with courage. It has the idea of taking a stand. First, he says, you've done everything to stand firm. Now you stand firm. You make your stand. Now, catch this. This is such a simple passage. 
The idea is I, once I'm surrendering here and following the Lord's instruction, then I can stand firm. And since I can stand firm, I should stand firm. There's no reason now to back up. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to fear confrontation. We just be what God's called you to be. Enjoy your life. Enjoy Jesus. Enjoy the journey. Yes, it's going to come with slings and onslaughts and arrows and fiery darts and missiles or whatever you want to call them. Hey, but you are covered. You have standing in in your stead and for your stead and for your blessing, you have the very presence of the Holy Spirit in your life so that you can stand firm, so that you can take courage. So take courage. You can do what you need to do. You can be what you need to be. You can accomplish what God's called you to accomplish. All this gets back to just faithfully obeying the Lord, does it not? I just don't know how I'm going to get through this, Brother Joe. I just don't know how I'm going to get through this. Hey, you're going to get through it by the grace of God like everybody else gets through it. The Bible tells us there's no temptation taking you such as is common to man. In other words, you're no different from everybody else. Why are you trying to make your situation so horrible? <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my pain. <laughs> Anybody else been singing that lately? <laughs> we all have. Listen. Even Peter said, your brethren throughout the world are fi- facing the same obstacles all over the planet. All the people that love Jesus have confrontations, have struggles, have battles, have things going on. But we stand mighty and we stand victorious and we stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. I need a better witness than that. At least sound like you believe it. Amen. <laughs> so we stand firm. Now. This is where it comes to the actual, here's how you resist. Here's how you, here's how you stand firm. He says, so we stand firm with all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, we should be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, you got your pencil out. I'm going to tell you something profound. Praying. He says, with all prayer. Prayer. Are you ready? Prayer is talking to God. That is not profound. Yes, it is. <laughs> Who are you talking to? It's not like talking to Pastor Joe. It's not like talking to each other. You're coming, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. You're sure you're, oh, I'm all great. God, God knows how you're doing. Yeah. So when you talk to him, you don't have to put on a front. Right. You don't have to wear the little Christian mask. <laughs> you don't have to pretend. You just talk with God. You're talking to God. You're talking to God who's omniscient. He knows all things. You're talking to God who's omnipotent. He's all powerful. You're talking to God who's, um, who's, who's all places at all times and meeting all the needs in our life. We're talking to God. And now, as I look at this word in the Greek language a little bit before, and I've taught on prayer many times in years. I've, we've done a series of messages on prayer. But this word is prosukume in the Greek language. And there's different words that translate in English. Our language is a bit limited in saying what a word means from another language. But this is a word which, which it, it's taken from a word which has to do with breathing or with wind. All right? And the, and, the, and the idea here is just, it's just your, it's the breath of your life. You're praying at all times. Just like you breathe at all times and your heart's beating all times. You're breathing in prayer. You're breathing out prayer. Just praying at all times. Now, I, it's one thing, as I mentioned a while ago, to have a time when you, you sit down with the Lord and you have a time of prayer. And we all, I think that's a good discipline for every life. But what is required for all of us all the time is that we should all be praying. We should all be talking to God. I don't know about you. If you've been saved a long time, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you do it all the time. You know, you're just talking to God all the time, I mean, aren't you? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You're just talking to God. It's one thing. Now we have these people used to might look at you like you're crazy. I mean, I used to drive down the road talking to Jesus and singing to Jesus all the time. People look at me like, oh, what's he listening to? Nothing. I'm just praising the Lord. I need to listen to some. I got it going already right here. All right, I'm tuned in. But now, you know, we got these cell phones and people have these earbuds and stuff. And you see them standing on the, nobody's around them. They're standing on the sidewalk. <laughs> We'd arrested that guy 10 years ago, you know. <laughs> but now he's at. Oh, stop it. <laughs> what is he doing? He might be praying. 
All right? So nobody's going to think you're weird like they used to think. So you can just pray all the time. Amen. They ask you who you're talking to, you just tell them, God. Now they might arrest you for sure. <laughs> but you are talking to God. And you're in tune with your Heavenly Father. And what an invitation that God has given to us. You know, talk to me. Get after him. You know, you say, what's his phone number? Jeremiah 33, 3. If you don't know it, look it up. So, well, maybe just maybe you can look it up. Well, you, you'll, you'll stop listening to what I'm preaching. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's what Jeremiah 33 says. It's an invitation. God says, give me a call. Talk to me. It's Bluetooth, wireless, whatever you need. It's okay. All right. God's got his own Wi-Fi signal. He, you can make a direct contact because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the router. You can make, it, you can make a complete call. Just make the call. Talk to God. When? All the time. I need to talk to God all the time because I'm all the time dealing with conflicts. I'm all the time dealing with issues. I'm all the time dealing with things in my life that need, I need some direction. I need some, uh, I need some courage perhaps, or I need a word from God, or I need just a peace from God about something. And so we go through the day. I go to bed at night. I'm praying when I go to bed at night. I get up in the morning and usually first thing, I, I, something to the Lord. Good morning, Lord. I'm, I can't do this without you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I trust you today. My feet are getting ready to hit the floor. I don't want to hit them without my, my gospel shoes. You know, so I'm praying, I'm talking to the Father today. This is, the, this is what Christianity ultimately really boils down to, does it not? It is fellowship with God. The Apostle uh, John tells us in 1 John, brethren, this is the message that we've, we, we have for you. We have seen, we've heard, we've tasted and handled the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you know, this is God. We have, in our message is that you can have fellowship with him. What's that mean? We're talking with God. Spending time with God, listening to God, following Jesus. This is the simplicity, but this is where our battle also takes place. We talk to God. When do we talk to God? He breaks it down like this, about four things. He says, one, we pray always. You know what that means continually, right? Listen to Luke 18, one. Said, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times, this is Jesus, he's telling them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. I'll tell you what happens when you don't pray all, at all times like that, just giving each part of your day over to God, you do lose heart. Because one of Satan's favorite tools against you, one of those little fiery arrows comes across as discouragement. It's not going to work for you. It's not going to work out for you. They're not, you're, not, you're not this or you're not that. It's not going to make it. And on and on, the lies and the discouragement comes. And we will literally let him steal our courage if we're not careful. That's why we have the shield of faith. But at the same time, by holding up our shield of faith, we are praying to the Lord always. What does 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 say? Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? It's just talking to Jesus all day long. As you go through the day. I'll be walking down the hall here. Somebody said, what did you say? Oh, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Jesus. Who are you talking to? Jesus. All right. We're, don't worry. He can listen to both of us at the same time. <laughs> He could carry on multiple conversations if you're worried about that because he is an infinite God with an infinite mind that's far above our understanding and he hears, this is the beautiful thing about it, that God is the one who's inviting us to pray and in scripture commanding us to pray and calling us to prayer. Should we not pray and should we not take everything to the Lord? Colossians puts it this way, my brethren, you should devote yourselves to prayer. What does it mean? Now, I know some of you are so caught up in that thing. This is prayer. I've got to get on my knees. Maybe I'm a two kneer. Maybe I'm a right knee or left knee. Or maybe I just pray and stand. Maybe I should bow my head. Maybe I should have to close my eyes. Listen, if I close my eyes all the time, I pray I'd be in wreck all the time. <laughs> running into walls or running into you out in the car in the traffic. This is, this is not talking about that, again, that devotional time where you really spend some time with the Lord. But this is talking about in the, in the, in the journey and the conflict of the day, you're turning everything over to God. And you're exposing every situation and every need. And that's where he comes says, always in, in the spirit. Now, there's some drama out there today that tells people you pray in the Spirit means you pray in tongues. There's nothing in the Bible that says that praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues. There's stuff that talks about tongues, but if, if to pray in the Spirit means to pray in tongues, then the, all those places where the Bible commands us to walk in the Spirit, am I walking in tongues? Or to live in the Spirit, this place where it says live in the Spirit, do I live in tongues? <laughs> no. When it says to pray in the Spirit, basically, and you follow this through the Scripture, it doesn't take a great theologian to figure this out. One, it's that I'm praying in agreement with God and, and in the name of Jesus Christ. All right? It's all about Jesus, by the way. Even when the Spirit comes, says, Jesus says he's not going to exalt himself. He's going to exalt me. 
So to pray in the name of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that in our thinking we think, okay, it means I'm going to end my prayer by saying, in Jesus' name, amen. That's not what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the one who invited us to pray and gave us authority when he said, you pray and you ask the Father in my name. Now, to do that, the it, best way I can put it is like the power of attorney. Some of you are familiar with that. You have somebody who's going to operate and, and, and do something for you and carry out some action on your behalf. You give that person a legal power of attorney. You know, if, if I'm sitting here today and, and I want Gary Juarez to, I'm going to be out of town perhaps, and I want Gary Juarez to purchase something for me that needs to be done and requires my signature, I can have what's called a power of attorney taken care of, and it will give Gary within rights and, as well as restrictions about what he can do in my name. And he has to be legally accepted as Joe Arms in that regard. So he can take care of my business for me in that way. It's called the simple power of attorney. Jesus Christ, by saying this, gave us a power of attorney. That I can pray in his name. That when I go to the Father and I'm asking the Father, it's as though Jesus himself is asking, whatsoever you shall ask my Father in my name, that will he do. Now, but not just in his name. Name goes beyond just a title. Remember, it has to do with his person, his, his character, his reputation. Everything about him is involved in that. So I'm asking in agreement with, well, simply put, to, being to, to ask according to what his will is and his nature is. And I'm not asking something based on my own selfish desires or needs or wants, you know. I'm asking according to the will of God. Another place in Scripture is if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's praying in the name of Jesus Christ. That's praying in the Spirit. It's in line with God's will and God's purposes and God's plan for my life. And I can guarantee you that I'm praying for victory in my spiritual, in my spiritual journey and in my spiritual battles. And I'm asking God for wisdom and grace and victory. I'm going to get that because I'm praying in his name. So I'm moving forward, not representing Joe Arms now. I'm representing Christ and his kingdom and his presence in my life. So I'm praying in the name of Jesus and according to his will. And he said this word, with all petition may say supplication in your, transla- in your translation, but that word basically means urgent request. Like in Hebrews, it says, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and that we may re- find grace and in- in help in the time of need. That's a petition, a request in the time of need. That's a supplication. That's the word desis in the Greek language. So as I'm, as I'm communicating, talking with God, the breath of my life is him. At that same time, I'm making a supplication. Lord, I need a victory here. I need a word here. I need direction here. I need strength here. I need your peace here. I need your patience here. That's the supplication that we're making. So we're moving forward. Always, he said, that's pretty much as life goes by. And I'm moving in the spirit of Christ, in the name of Christ, and I'm believing God. And God's moving in my life. With all petition, Request be made known to God. There's this passage that Peter writes to the church. Listen to this, and it's a great passage. He says, for the eyes, this ought to comfort you today, by the way. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That's good stuff, isn't it not? God's eyes, God's looking after me. God's looking after me. He's looking after you. And sometimes we get so worried, oh, I just don't know if this is going to work. God's looking after you. He's got your back and your front <laughs> and every other part. He's got you. And, but it goes on to say, not only the eyes of the Lord upon the righteous. Listen to the rest of this verse. And his ears are tending to their desis, to their supplications, to their urgent request. God's just ready to hear. And so often, instead of prayer, we just worry. Or we react in a way that's unrighteous. Now, here's how we're praying. We're praying always. We're praying in the Spirit. We're letting these supplications as part of our prayer life go through, and we are on the alert. This is the idea of wakefulness and watchfulness. It's not just I'm I'm on guard. You guys in the military know what it means to be on guard. You have guard duty. But it's another thing to be on guard duty and still be watchful. (laughs) It's not just awake. This word means more than just awake. It means watching while you're awake. There's a lot of people just kind of awake, but they're not watching, and they're easily run over by the enemy on so many levels. Their marriages are wrecked, their finances are wrecked, their children's lives are messed up, and they're just, they're, and they're not, and they've been caught, it seems, almost by surprise, and they shouldn't be. Now, some of those things happen in spite of the fact that we're watching, and that's where we continue to pray, though. That's when we continue to believe God. That's when we continue to stand our ground. That's when we continue to stand firm. 
But it does require this part from us. It says, I am on guard and I am watching. Matthew 26, 41 puts it this way. Jesus is speaking. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation for your spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So what do you do when the flesh is weak? Remember the spirit's willing and you stand ground and you watch and you pray. Back to that chapter in Luke a while ago, 18, verse 1, what did he say? He sh- shared with them in the parable that they should always pray and not lose heart. And he mentions two items that he tacks onto this. One is perseverance and the other is petitions. So here's what it boils down to. I need to pay attention. I can't be ignorant. I can't, I can't ignore the facts that there's a word. Listen, if I choose to continue to ignore what God's doing, what God's telling me to do, I'm going to end up in a worse wreck than I even imagined in my life. The problems that I will invite into my heart, to my life, to my home, will be insurmountable. And all too often, it seems like we just let all that stuff come in before we do finally wake up and we get our eyes open. Well, let's not wait to the moment. Let's get our eyes open now. As he said, let's, let's have perseverance and continue with the, the supplications and the urgent requests. Let's not be ignorant. And with that, we can't be idle. You can't just say, I got the armor on. No, I resist. I pray. I stand and I'm praying and not only for my prayers, I'm praying for all the saints. Paul followed this up in the next verse and pray for me. So I ask you why you're praying out there and why you're doing it. Pray for me. Pray for each other. You pray for the saints. You pray for the church. We believe God. So we, we're, we're, we're fighting. And as long as we're moving forward and standing our ground and resisting, we're not, we're not facing defeat here. But if we're inattentive and we don't watch and pray, guess what happens? We get defeated. Now, I know that probably somebody's out there thinking, now, Pastor Joe, this just sounds way too religious. (laughs) Do this, do that, do this. I mean, when do I have time for me? This is time for you. It's time to save your life and let God do something powerful in your life. It's God's way of bringing you victory. It's God's way of introducing you to that abundant life that he promised, not just life. It's that way of bringing you into the deeper relationship with him. And therefore, guess what? If my relationship deepens with him, my relationship deepens with you, with my wife, my family. It gets deeper. And I've had people sit in my office and they're just fussing and fighting in their marriage. And they say, we just don't know what to do. My wife is this. Well, my husband's this. And my my first verse to always anybody in marriage counseling, so if you come get ready for it, is this one. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. So if your wife or your husband's your enemy, why don't you start trying to please God first? Because when your ways are pleasing the Lord, it means that God's been doing something in your life. God's doing something deep in your heart. And then those around me that seem to be my enemies are not my enemies anymore. Let's seek to please God. This is it, walking in him, fellowship in him. And in the process of all those things, there's a war going on, but we're victorious. We're winners. Now, simply put, today, you may be here, and you're what the Bible calls a natural man, a natural woman. And what that simply means is that you've never come to a place in your life to give your heart and life to Christ. So it just calls you a natural person. Jesus dealt with this when he was dealing with that religious guy named Nicodemus in John 3 when he says, hey, Nicodemus is saying, okay, what, what's the, how do I get to heaven? How do I know? He said, listen, the wind blows where it wills. You, you don't get it. He said, but, but the spirit is just the same way. He's moving. And you've got to realize that your need is spiritual need, not a natural need. But isn't the world looking for natural things, not spiritual things? If I had more money, I'd be happy. If I had a better situation, I'd be happy. If I had a better car, I'd be happy. If I had a better home, if I had better kids, had a better husband, had a better wife, it's always something better. Let me tell you what Hebrew says, that God has done something better. And it repeats, repeats it several times. He has made something better for us. If you're looking for something better, it's going to be found in Christ. And when the moment you turn and finally give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and surrender to him, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to be a natural person anymore. The Bible says you become a spiritual person. All right? You're a spiritual person now. You have the spirit of God living in you. You've been, Jesus uses this term that's kind of a common vernacular. You're born again. Born again means you have spiritual life happens now. And until you meet Jesus Christ, no no rebirth takes place. You're just a natural person. 
In the Old Testament, it says that the Spirit of the Lord, that the, that the Spirit of man is, 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 is the candle of the Lord. In other words, God has something he wants to ignite in you. And it's down in this part of your life. And it's, it's not that you don't have a spirit, it's just dead. The Bible says we're spiritually dead in our trespasses and sin. But when you come to Jesus, life comes in. Everlasting life, fullness of life, abundant life. It happens in the moment you give your life to Christ. And now, if you try to go back and try to live your life just like a natural person, like everybody else lives their life, it's not going to work for you, buddy. I'm sorry. It's just, ma'am, it's not going to happen. You, you're just a different person now. And that, that, that round peg won't fit in that square hole anymore. <laughs> You're different. Praise God for that. Amen. I encourage you, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, don't try to substitute it for being a religious person or a Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or whatever else. Buddhist, Muslim. You need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Give your life to him today. Those of you here that are believers, if you've sat and you've listened to this spiritual armor thing, and God's let the light start coming on about this spiritual warfare in your life, and you realize that you've been losing because you hadn't been fellowshipping with Jesus and walking in that fellowship, breathing in him in and breathing him out in your daily life, I encourage you to come find a place at this altar. The church and the world lost a great hero of the faith as far as I'm concerned this last week with the loss of Billy Graham. But one thing Billy Graham was known for was giving those public altar calls. You know, a lot of churches don't do that anymore. They refuse to have altar calls. You know, that, that, that offends people. You don't put people on the spot. Jesus, you know, put it this way. Jesus was never, he's not like today's churches. Today's churches are just looking for members and what I call fans of Jesus. Jesus never looked for fans. He looked for followers. And I challenge you to be a follower of Christ, not a fan of Jesus. Follow Christ. Commit your life to Christ. So we give altar calls at Believer's Fellowship. to give people a chance to step out past their pride, past their opinion of what others might think, say, or do, and get, with right, get it right with God. Some of you Christians today need to be at this altar getting things right with God. Some of you perhaps need to give your life to Jesus today. So I want you to stand with me. We're going to have a word of prayer. And as we stand, musicians come. Those who will be helping me here at the altar, you come. But let me say this.